Leaves, they're compact. Pringles, compact. That was where the idea came from. Burr and Velcro. It's all about uh, the analogy and problem solving. So what I'm doing is saying, looking at Tahrir Square and the Egyptian Revolution, and mapping that across to innovation, creativity and leadership. So this talk's going to look at firstly setting the scene, so a bit of incubation, then illumination through particularly looking at, if anybody heard Andy's talk earlier about climate, uh, mapping the different elements of climate to um, Tahrir Square and transferring knowledge. And then we'll talk about it. So, I really love this uh, poster, which uh, is a little flowchart of, it says, if Mubarak leaves, if yes, dissolve parliament, then we change the constitution. If no, then protest, disobedience and strikes will continue. So, this is... Uh, the four P's, except it's three P's and a C, because I don't like the word press. Um, climate. Uh, the climate, in this instance, is Tahrir Square, particularly. The revolution happened throughout Egypt, but Tahrir Square, for many people, was the centre of it. And people, well, a previous talker today was saying that you know, it's only sort of the, maybe I'm unfairly paraphrasing, but the two and a half percent of people who come up with the bright ideas and struggle to get other people to accept them. Personally, I think if you look at something like Egypt, when you get hundreds of thousands of people out on the streets, it's actually an unleashing of the creativity in all of us. And so, by its nature, you had every style of people, people who perhaps prefer more incremental change, would still be involved in certain ways. The process, essentially, there was real self-organisation. Although there were organisations in Egypt, by and large, throughout the revolution, it was the mass of people themselves who threw up new and their own sorts of organisation. And then the product, well, that was very clear. It was calling for the overthrow of Mubarak. It was something that people could all identify with. So, if we take this equation, which says performance equals potential minus inhibitors. So what do I mean by that? Well, if you look at it as a change project, it took 18 days from the 25th of January 2011 to topple Mubarak. There were a huge number of inhibitors. The largest armed forces in Africa and the Arab world, that's not including the interior minister and the paramilitary forces. I think it's probably about the 10th largest armed forces in the world. <coughs> Police brutality, etc., uh, this makes it clear what people were used to facing. People couldn't have an open conversation in cafes, etc. So, what's the potential? Well, the greater the control, the greater the tendency to instability. And you can see that within organisations as well. And many people have talked about that. So the greater the, if you like, uh, a top-down approach in organisations. Don't underestimate the power of self-organisation. There's this belief that a manager or a leader has to tell people what to do. And finally, in purpose, there is unity. And in unity, there is power. I'll explain this through looking at what the actual performance was. So, this was, these are some tweets from the day 
January the 25th. So you'll see from the very top one that actually the demands were talking about shortening the presidential term, not actually we want to overthrow Mubarak now. The second one, I'm not expecting a revolution. I'm expecting protests. Let's not shoot high, so as not to disappoint people. And then you see things starting to develop. Pardon my Arabic, but the crowd chanting Salmeya, peaceful. And then uh, the tear gas comes. And yet, within a few days, Terrier Square had been turned into an organisational centre where you had stages, pharmacy, artwork. Uh, the KFC was taken over and turned into a, a makeshift health clinic, wall of newspapers, bloggers, rubbish bins, etc. So. <coughs> How did the largest, you know, largest army in Africa, etc., get overturned? What happened? Well, I believe it is looking at climate, and here I'm distinguishing between culture and climate, like Andy did earlier, in that climate is recurring patterns of behaviour, attitudes, and feelings that characterise life in the organisation. So, there are nine measurable dimensions. The SOQ is one way of measuring uh, the climate. And I'm now going to look at the different nine different dimensions because I believe that in Charrier Square you had a perfect climate created to enable uh, the overthrow of Mubarak. Because what I'd also like you to do is think about projects or the climate within your own workplace and is it high, is it low? And as Andy said, you can take that further and think about the climate of a team, a project or an individual. So, Terrier Square, you saw collective decisions being taken. Cleaning, medicine, clinics, performance, security. People were involved in what they could help and do. There was a clear, unambiguous vision and goal. And then a nice little tweet about when people wanted to speak, an orange was passed around, when you held the orange you could speak. And there were lots of different ways of enabling people to have the opportunity to get involved. And here you see people actually queuing to get into Tarrier Square in an orderly queue. And I said a simple vision, and you can encapsulate it in that one word, which means it says leave. So, freedom. Well, you've got this, to what extent is their independence in behaviour encouraged? Well, people could, were able to make proposals. If it made sense, then something was adopted. People had the opportunity to volunteer. And the challenge and involvement meant that people felt that they had permission to try things out. The man tells us there's no committee that organises a supplier to rear. People simply take initiative. Friends pull money, and those have made, with funds make purchases for the poor. A nice little example, another tweet. People have rooted power from the streetlights and they're charging their cell phones in Terrier Square. And here's one where 
despite the fact that when they set up the clinics, they had very firm rules that it should only be trained medical staff, etc., who would be able to do any medical operation. But quite clearly, when uh, a situation where uh, Molotov cocktails and rocks were being thrown towards them, and you're having to treat 30 people, you adapt. And therefore, um, her sister, uh, who works in HR and hates blood, was doing stitches. Trust and openness. And Andy said it's one of the, the difficult, most difficult ones, and one of the most important as well, because if you have a high level of trust and openness, it means that individuals can be frank and open. And in the workplace, uh, that's incredibly important, but also difficult to achieve. Because when it is low, people are suspicious, they guard themselves, they keep their plans to themselves, not sharing things. And Stephen earlier was talking about uh, what motivates people to, to share ideas. And Tarrier Square, you had a situation where people went through shared experiences and uh, hundreds of people actually lost their, lost their lives. Uh, during that time. And, and yet, many people spoke about the environment created, but many times felt like the safest place in Egypt. And you have respect for women, health clinics, I mentioned that, exception to the qualified medics. So, it is also true to say that if you look at Egypt today, um, there is a mixture in terms of the attitude towards women. I think only a week or two ago there was a demonstration uh, of women to Tahrir Square that actually got attacked uh, by a, a group of men. And that I think is why what I'm talking about is the actual period that enabled uh, the revolution to occur. And it's how you actually continue to maintain a climate that is difficult. So, you had the sight of, in the run-up, in the first few days of 2011, there had been a number of churches that had been attacked in, uh, and burnt down in Egypt. And yet, uh, you saw this coming together of Christians and Muslims. There was an important uh, feature of the sort of unity and trust that developed during those days. And there you see the present and the, and the cross as a very common sign. And here you see people being willing to be searched before they went through uh, into Tahrir Square. Idea time. You hear about companies like Google who give their staff 15% of their time to, practice, to, to work on, on, on new ideas. Um, you know, whether or not they actually have to work extra hours or how many hours they work, I mean, it's a slightly different question. But it is important that you do, that people have that time. Because in Tahrir Square, uh, a lovely quote there, Tahrir Square is the biggest brainstorming and think tank in the Middle East and probably the world now. <laughs> And you saw this sort of thing appearing. I mean, I've never seen such a great use for polystyrene uh, fast food containers <laughs> as putting up messages about what is happening, etc. And here is a catapult. Now, it's a great idea whether or not it, it worked, but the, the more poignant thing is that if you look at the people, you actually see a number of them with bandages, etc. But this wasn't just for fun. Uh, the previous night, Tahrir Square, uh, or day, had been attacked by, people might remember seeing the, the camels and the, the horses riding through Tahrir Square. And the remnants, if you like, of the Mubarak regime was able to 
uh, put prisoners, uh, thugs essentially, out onto the streets and attacked uh, Tahrir Square. Uh, there were a number of people killed over that night and a huge battle. The playfulness and humour How important is humour and play in the workplace? And how often you know, do you... You can, you can smell a workplace when you go into it, in terms of the sort of atmosphere. And I think, despite the fact, maybe because of the fact, that of the seriousness of the conditions that people faced there, there was an atmosphere of jokes, of culture. There was concerts played most nights, there were new artists emerged. There was that feeling of, of safety, yeah. the spontaneity and the ease. People were actually having the best time of their lives, some of them, during this period. And I love this. In the background, on the top right, that is the headquarters of the ruling party, the National Democratic Party that got burnt down. Okay, on, I think, the Day of Anger, Friday the 28th of... January 2011. And here, uh, this sign, I believe, says it is the new headquarters of the <laughs> National Democratic Party, the burnt out van. Yes, it does. Thank you. And there were plenty, you know, that, that humour was there. So, conflict. And yeah, of course there was conflict. But what we're looking at in terms of measure, what was the conflict like in terms of the revolutionaries and the people uprising against Mubarak? And, I mean, if you look at Egypt uh, today, where you've got um, the... I think there were, there were loads and loads of different presidential candidates. There was people from uh, the Muslim Brotherhood, uh, the Salafis, from secular people. And yet, within the uh, period of the overthrow of Barra, actually, there was a lot of unity. And so, the uh, word Samia, how do you pronounce that word? Samia. Samia. Yeah, peaceful, was something that predominated. And even when people had to resort to violence, they still wanted to be peaceful. It was being violent in terms of understanding that the approach to the army was crucial. And so you'll see pictures in a bit. That's people sleeping on the tanks. About discipline and being attacked. And about tolerance for others. And... So you might not agree with everything everybody says, but it's that unity that was so key. And again, Christians will pray in Tahrir Square tomorrow. We shall circle them and protect them as they protected us. Okay, the supportive ideas. So, we're all used to that spontaneous response when people come up with a new idea that often people will knock it straight back down again. And so, because what? There are so many different ways that you can say no. We always often look for what's wrong in an idea rather than what we can take out of an idea to strengthen. So, Terrier Square, idea support became natural, and you had that variety. So I love this, this is a barber's shop. Little corner of the square saying, Revolution's Barber. Oh, and the haircuts were free as well. <laughs> and now this is looking at, yeah, ideas of Paul prototyping. Um, some of you might have seen Tamsin's talk this morning, where she talked about prototyping, quick and rapid, 
you can see whether it works or not very rapidly and then change it and adapt it. Why was he wearing that? Because um, what was happening uh, was stones were being thrown. And there were sharp stones. There were stones that were thrown at people to cause damage to their heads and their noses. And then the next one is my absolute favourite. <laughs> I've never seen a better use for uh, a couple of loads of bread and a bit of cling film. Okay. So, debate. The you can sometimes have debate in political movements and people just end up talking and talking and talking and not do anything about it. Now, what was interesting was just how much people had to go through. So here you see uh, the couple of quotes I put. His latest offer, this is talking about Mubarak, is making some traction with many Egyptians. Some may be content to have him finish his term. And you can see that level of confidence. If you have a project in the workplace, you can see as soon as things start to get difficult, you'll get one or two people backing away from it. And the people who you thought were your supporters might not support you anymore. Secondly, here we have, I did not take part in the violence, which is a real moral dilemma for me right now, for it's the people who did, who saved me. And you see all these sorts of contradictions working out in people's head, but it's having that atmosphere where it is possible to have those disagreements uh, between viewpoints and ideas. And risk taking. So, you know, low risk, let me sleep on it, and maybe you have heard that one, uh, let's set up a committee. Instead, the big thing in Egypt was all about whose side is the army on? How can we win them over? Ten minutes in total. Okay. We started late, Clive, because you didn't arrive to the. So. Is that conflict? Sorry? Is that conflict? <laughs> negotiation. This is negotiation, this is risk taking. <laughs> We're talking risk taking. So. And I think this is more risk-taking. And that gets even more risk-taking. But it was that... Because what you found is that after people for the first time came out to the, on the streets in their masses on January the 25th, they lost their fear. And I think that that loss of fear meant that people collectively had the confidence to be able to do things like that. They knew that if the army moved against them, they were lost, and therefore they had to win over the army. And so that is talking. You know, it's debate, but also it's understanding what the, the key to actually winning. And it was with people like him who came over uh, to the side of the revolution. So... The climate, I would argue, created an interior square, enabled and supported a collective set of behaviour skills and personal qualities to create, organise and use processes that produced the engine of the Egyptian revolution that overthrew Mubarak. So each of those elements needed to be worked upon. And I think that that is something that in all our projects, it is that combination that it's all too easy just to think about the process and forget about the other elements. There were, of course, other skills that all came to, uh, to be of real import. Teamworking, awareness, that streetwise now, because... Having said all that about self-organisation, it is also true to say that 
there were people who'd been there who had been protesting uh, against elements of the regime for 10, 20 years beforehand. So it wasn't as if there was nothing there. And that, I think, is where people like ourselves come in, because you pick up that street nets, you pick up that gumption to use a lovely but old and hardly used word anymore. Was it a Twitter revolution? Facebook revolution? That was one of the arguments. Clearly, people use all sorts of different. And I think that's, again, another lesson. You use what you can. Banging on lampposts became far more effective than tweeting at certain points. Heterophily and homophily is another quite nice example because here we say a friend called to say two of her friends will protest tomorrow they work as investment bankers you also get shop workers in the neighbourhood excited laundry workers will join homophily means love of the same and again it's easy for us to gather around the people who think similar to us it's in organisations that are most successful are ones that embrace the love of the different. So it is diverse groups, and that was clearly what you had in Terrier uh, Square. So fitting it all together, people, the four P's again. And I'll finish on that one. People thought we were mad. Look where madness got us. And finally, there's even a book on the tweets from Tahrir, which is a lovely story, and I think it's probably the first ever book of tweets that has been published. So, hopefully it's time for a nice